Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we're using a slightly different setup today for our lecturing. Um, so if everyone could just confirm that they can see the screen and they can hear us, that'd be great. And we'll get started in a moment. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our lecture, which will hopefully have no technical issues, except that all three of us have Jinx. just spent 10 minutes playing with Zoom filters. So who knows what's on top of our heads. But Tom is tricking you all because his is in fact not a filter because he doesn't know how to make the filters work. Wow. So he's just wearing sunglasses in his room, ready to type. Um, so welcome to lecture eight, where we will be doing some fun stuff. Maybe, maybe not. We are going to learn about some fun stuff today. Um, hope that everyone is ready to not have any technical issues today um, because we're going from Tom's internet, not from mine. So that should hopefully make all the difference. All right, here we go. So yesterday we had a really exciting day um, in that uh, basically everything crashed. Um, so it was just the level of excitement was hectic, um, including VLAB and um, my whole internet, my whole computer. Um, yesterday, I was ready to just throw it all out the window, but we persevered, we learned something. So we went back and did one dimensional arrays again um, and sort of tried to solidify some of the knowledge we had. And hopefully we can keep working on our one dimensional arrays. I have a bit more um, of 1D arrays coming up next week as well. We also started looking at two-dimensional arrays, um, which help, you know, give us a bit of a grid and allow us to do some pretty cool stuff. Um, and um, also yesterday's technical issues did result in me being able to have a typist, uh, which is very exciting. So now I don't even have to type anymore, which is, you know, we'll see. It could be quite fantastic. And hopefully it demonstrates to you guys as well um, an aspect of pair programming as well, which is which could be nice. We'll see how we go. All right, today we're going to revisit the question that we did not finish uh, last week. You see, I've, I've tried to forget yesterday and I've moved it into last week. It was actually yesterday that all of this has gone down. So uh, we're going to finish the question that we did started yesterday because Jax has barely started exploring the park. In fact, he's still standing in that corner, a coordinate of nine, nine. So we really want him to, oh, my screen has not moved. I'm sorry. Well, we couldn't have had no issues at all. Why didn't someone tell me that my screen is not moving? Here we go, we're back. Okay. So uh, we're going to revisit the question where Jax is prancing about a park and visiting different locations. Um, and then we're going to talk about this whole scanf and end of file business because everyone has been, um, you know, asking about it on the forums and also uh, you're going to have to do it in your assignment. So we will do that as part of our Jax question. And then we're going to uh, talk about pointers. So we're going to learn um, basically what a pointer is and kind of introduce you to pointers. I'm gonna start real slow with pointers. I'm not gonna throw you into the deep end um, because um, I don't know, pointers can be, they're not tricky themselves, but they can be tricky to understand uh, based on what they're actually doing and what's going on. So we're gonna start slow, ease into it. 
uh, and do a bit more pointers next week as well. All right. Where's the lecture code at? The lecture code is, again, exactly where you would expect it to be if you were tuning in uh, yesterday. It is currently sitting in live week four, which is pretty nice. Okay, Tom, can we please go over to our G edit because we're gonna continue with the Jack's question and then we're gonna come back for me to draw something. Alrighty, we're now in G edit. Let's just open up the right file. Alrighty, and we've got the file open. Note that I didn't forget the ampersand this time. I've learned my lesson. Where would you like to get started, Sasha? Uh, Jackson, uh, J, uh, jjparkadventure.c. Perfect, we're in there. Okay, so let's have a look at our piece of code that we did yesterday. We started out with some starter code, which is exactly what's happening with your assignment. So we wanted to introduce you to this concept of starter code as well. Um, and you will get starter code for your assignment that has lots of these little to do things in them, which is where you come in and you rescue the whole thing. Um, and you actually do a lovely, uh, you know, actually write the code in it. So then what happens is uh, we have a park in this question and the park is a 10 by 10 grid um, because every park that I visit is a perfect square. And then we have Jack's positioned in the lower bottom corner, which when we drew the grid yesterday was at the coordinate 99. So all that we got up to yesterday is we drew our array of arrays. And then Tom, if you can scroll down to the print park function. Yep. Um, we filled in our uh, Jack's struct, if you guys remember. So we initialized the struct to put Jack's in position 99. So we, we actually, gave him position row column nine and position row, position column nine and position row nine, which allowed him to have his position related to his structure. And then we went off to our print park function and we added in to print his name or the character that stands for his name um, in, in the actual part. So um, we inserted, if you can have a look on line 66, we inserted an if statement which says that if Jack's position is equal to row and Jack's position column is equal to column, then we're gonna print out the character that stands for Jack's name there instead, instead of a zero, because the park is initialized by printing a grid of zeros. So if we have a quick reminder, if we go over to our um, terminal and we compile this so that we can see what we have up to this point in time. Yep, so we'll use the up arrow to get to DCC compile compiled it let's run JJ Park Adventure we run it and what we can see is that there's the 10 by 10 grid with a J in the bottom right hand corner fantastic so we've got this lovely grid and J is standing in the corner but now it's time for Jax to start moving so let's uh, quickly come back to me and and I'm going to draw a little diagram of what Jax is doing. And I strongly recommend as you start working on your assignment that you draw a diagram and put the farmer in the diagram and actually see where the farmer is moving in that sort of visual way where you've drawn it on a piece of paper as well. So we have, um, and I'm drawing because Tom's grid was pretty average yesterday. So I'm going to try and draw a better grid I have not succeeded. Grid drawing is very difficult. Okay, I'm one short, just like Tom was yesterday. So for all that, um, me bagging him out. Serves me right. Okay, so if you remember in our two dimensional arrays, the rows run this way. So this is row zero, row one, row two, row three, row four, row five, row six, row seven, row eight, and row nine. And again, remember because the indexing goes from zero 
to the size. So it starts at zero. That's why we want it to be going until from zero to nine. And the columns are running across. Also starting at zero, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, Jax is standing in the corner over here. So I'm gonna draw a J where Jax is standing. So let's have a think now, um, what's going to happen when we are moving around. So if, let's say a user will put in a command, they want to move left, right, up or down. So they can move left, right, up or down. If Jax is moving to the left, then what's going to happen to our rows and columns? So if we're moving to the left, what's gonna to happen to our rows and columns? Who can tell me? Yeah, so if Jax is moving to the left, then we're going to have, are we going to have row minus one or are we going to remember the row is here? My row is nine. So if I do row minus one, I'm going to go to row is equal to eight. So I'm actually going to end up here if I do row minus one. Yeah. Yeah. So column is going to go minus one. So if I move to the left, my column is going to minus one. Uh, if I move to the right and I'm not standing on the corner there, then what's going to happen if I move to the right? Yeah, it's okay. And this is part of why it's always really handy to draw the grid because then you can really see what's changing and where it's going. Is it going to the positive or negative? Yep. So if I move to the right, my column is going to add. Okay. If I move up, okay. If I'm moving up this way, then what's going to change? So I'm still going to be in the same column, but what's going to change here? I'm going to be Yep, so good. So row minus one, excellent. And then if I'm standing, uh, I'll just put Jax here so we can see where he is. If I'm moving down, then what's going to change this time? So I'm still going to be in the same column here, but what, what is going to change if I move down to here? Yep, so the row is going to add up. Yep, excellent. So now we have a little bit of movement happening where we know in which direction we need to move. And again, I strongly recommend you draw the grid so that you can see where the movement is happening. It's much easier to see it when you can draw it and visualize it. Tom, can we please switch back to the code now? And we're going to try and implement this um, into a little bit of code. Alrighty, we're back on the code. Let's go back in. Where would you like me to go? Okay, so if you could please uh, go, we now need to scan in um, that command from the user. So we need to know what the user actually wants to do. We wanna know where uh, we want to scan in a command. So if we want to scan in a command, then we're definitely going to need uh, somewhere to scan it into. And we're going to need to prompt the user for that command. So after we initialize Jax to his position, perhaps, and maybe after we print out the map so we can see the original map. After that, we're going to start to take some direction from the user. And I can see people are also asking about the EOF in the chat. It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> so let's do, um, let's have, I don't know, what should we do? We're gonna take in a character. We're gonna take an L, an R, a U or a D uh, when we ask the user where they want to go. So let's take a char direction and it's going to be uh, where we're gonna place our lovely character for the direction that we want the user to take. Cool, done. Okay, and then if we can please um, have a prompt for the user. So where would Jax like to go? Let's print F a statement. Where would Jax like to go? Yep.
And since we're doing a command that's left, right, up or down, probably a good way to structure this message would also be to uh, let the user know what they should enter. So in the prompt as well, if you can please add that the options are L, R, U or D. Perfect, done. Okay, and now we want to be able to scan in this direction. So how are we gonna scan in the direction? I think we, we're definitely going to use that lovely scan F again. So let's scan F, whatever the user is inputting in. So scan F and it's going to be a percent C. Yep. And we're gonna scan it into our direction. So ampersand and then direction because we're putting it into the variable direction. Thank you for reminding me about that ampersand. Okay, and so now what have we got to do now? Now we want to be able to move the dog around. Yeah? So if we need to be able to have a whole bunch of if statements now that will check where the dog is standing, sorry, where, what the command is. So if it's a left, then we're going to need, uh, you know, to do something else. If it's a right, we're gonna to need to do something else and so on and so forth. And someone has rightly pointed out, Tom, that you do need a space before the percent C. Um, so in case anyone, right now, it's not going to make a difference, but it will on the next iteration of what we're going to do, absolutely. Um, I, sorry, I just didn't. Okay, so let's do our first if statement. Let's move the dog around. What should I put in the if statement? What should we put in the if statement? What do we think? We need to know what the command is. So we're going to need to do some comparison with what command was input into the system by the user. So let's have a think what we would do in the if statement. What do you guys reckon? What would go into that first if statement? And if just a reminder that the space before the percent C, it skips over any leading white space. So if anyone's pressed enters or has spaces, it's going to skip all that until it finds a character. Yeah, so a few people have said beautiful, so if direction is equal to whatever it is, either the L or the up or the whatever it is. So let's let's put that in. So if direction, and remember we're gonna use a double equal sign because we are comparing. Um, so if Tom, if you can type in direction is equal, equal. Yep. And then in single apostrophes, because we want a letter character, and that means we want it to be um, in single apostrophes. So which direction should we go into first? Should we go left? Let's go left first, why not? Alrighty. Okay, so if we go left first, then we have already said that what's going to happen is that our column is going to decrease. So it's going to minus by one. We're gonna stay in the same row, but the column is going to decrease by one. So which column are we decreasing? What would be the variable name? that's going to get degre decreased, not decreased. No one's decreasing anything. Hopefully no one's spilled oil. Yeah, well done, Catherine. Jack's dot position column is going to be decreased by one. And we can do that with a minus minus as a shorthand, which means decrement by one. Sure, that's done. I yeah. was, I was gonna oh. default to doing it a different way, but that, that works well. Yeah. Cool. Okay, fantastic. So that's us moving to the left, okay? So now let's move to the right, or let's see, are we going to have an else if now? Are we going to have an else? Are we going to have, what are we gonna have? <laughs> Tom, did you just space instead of tab? Maybe. Uh, like a fireable offense, I think. <laughs> All right, I, I can stop the stream if you'd like. <laughs> no. Okay, Elsif, fantastic. Yes, well done, guys. Elsif, this is the best uh, sort of group programming exercise ever. Okay, so now Elsif, let's do it. Elsif direction is equal to uh, right. Already. 
you'll notice I used a tab there. You learn fast. Okay, then we have said before that if it's moving to the right, then our column is going to increase when we did it again. So let's increase the column. And again, the column is related to where Jax is standing. It's his position that we're increasing. So you're going to enter the struct for his position. So Jax dot position column. So, oh, well done. People are saying, would we need to check the user input? Um, you would, because what if they put uppercase uh, characters and so on and so forth? We're going to assume for now um, that people are going to be kind to us and put in the right characters. But absolutely, it is a very good practice to check that the user actually put in what you know what you want them to put in. So absolutely. And someone's asked, why is it uh, a small L in single apostrophes again? Because we're scanning in a character, um, remember that each character is actually a number on the ASCII table. So when you scan in, when you scan in with the single apostrophes, you're basically telling um, C that you're going to, you're actually using an ASCII character um, from the ASCII table. So that's why you want the single apostrophes on any letter. Um, okay, well done. So now we've moved to the left or the right. So I think now it's time to move up or down as well. Um, and someone has asked, is it better to put the L sif on a new line after the curly bracket or one space to the right? On a new line. Okay, so there are two, maybe there's more camps than just two, but we usually put them and in our style guide in 1511, we put them on the same line, one space after the curly bracket. Um, someone said, how would you check if the input is correct? You would check that that letter is between a small a uh, and a small z, or you would check that it, the letter is either L, R, U, or D, because if it's anything else, actually, you don't, you, you would, that's a mistake. You would ask the user for input again. So that would be how you would do the check. And, and Ray is thinking ahead. I like where he's going. We will be thinking about the boundaries. Absolutely, I do not want the dog to run out of the park. Um, so we will absolutely be considering these boundary conditions. Okay, so Tom, now we're gonna have another LCF for direction to the up. And Aditha, yes, if you put it without the single apostrophes, it would uh, yell at you. Alrighty, we've got an up direction. We've got an up direction. So once we go in the up direction, we've said that what happens is our column stays the same, but our row decreases. So now we're going to, um, actually we're going to decrease the row. So, and again, it's going to be the struct where Jax is standing. So Jax dot position row is going to decrease. Cool, done. Well done. And finally, the last location we can go is down. So let's let's move uh, Jax down as well. So let's LC if again. Um, and this time we're going to have a direction to uh, is equal to D. And we're going to, in that case, increase the row number as we have drawn on the diagram before. Perfect. Okay, excellent. And now let's print out the map again. So let's call our function to print the map again. And let's see what happens then. Alrighty, should we compile? And let's compile it to see what it does. All right, I won't forget to save this time. Jump into the terminal, use the up arrow to get to DCC again. It compiles all right, it would seem. And now dot slash JJ Park Adventure. Where would Jax like to go, Sasha? I think Jax would like to go one up. Up. All right. So we use the code U. And it looks as if Jax has moved one row up. Fantastic. So Jax has moved one row up. But um, it looks like our program only lets Jax move once, which is you know, a bit of a boring walk if all he can do is just move one step to the right or one meter to the right. That's not a lot of places to explore. 
So how do we set this program to be able to keep reading in commands so that we can actually keep walking and walking and walking? So what do you guys reckon? How do we, how do we keep reading in the commands? And Jax is, yeah, I have to say both my dogs are actually excellent at social distancing because um, they were adopted and they really don't really love people. Excellent. Lots of people are saying a loop. Lots of people want to do a loop. Someone wants to do an infinite loop, um, which is okay. Yeah, that's okay for me if we do an infinite loop for now, but we do want to be able to exit that loop at some stage. And someone has said a sentinel loop. I love that. I really do. That, uh, that seems like a really great way to be able to keep track of what's going on. Yeah. Okay. So there is two ways to do it. And I'm about to bring the whole EOF thing into existence. Okay. So this is going to be super exciting. Maybe, maybe not, but somewhat exciting. So let's talk about what EOF is. Okay. Tom, if you could please make some notes uh, in the comments. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So we've talked before in the previous weeks, we've had this, uh, I've often used exactly the same variable scanf return um, to show you that scanf returns a whole bunch of things to you. And what scanf returns is it returns to you how many things it has managed to scan in successfully. So if you've got a scanf and you're doing scanf percent D and you're putting it into a variable, you type in a number, and scanf has scanned it in, it will return one to you because it has scanned in something successfully. If you have this scanf and you have, you know, percent D and you've got it into a, um, into a lovely variable and you in fact type uh, something different, like a, no, that's not a good example. Percent D is not a good example. Let's say you've got a percent C and you're scanning in a percent C, okay? And you, instead of putting in a, percent C or, or a letter, you will put in a number. So you'll put in one or two or three. What will happen is it's going to say, actually, that's not really, um, that's a mismatch into what I was looking for. That's not a character, that's, that's a decimal number. So it's going to return zero because it's not going to read anything in successfully. Sasha, and then, I'll... yeah. Um, I th did you get it mixed up? Because if, you, if you've got percent C, won't it scan in zero as a number, as a character? It will scan in zero as a character, but if I press, yes, it will. Yes. So if we go with percent another D, way around. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Another way around. Sorry. See. Um, okay. And then it has one more option. Okay. So it can return any sort of positive number. It can return zero. And then the other thing that it can return to you is minus one. Okay. Now, if you remember yesterday, we did that highest number. And we use this minus one and everyone's like, why are we using minus one? Minus one is such, such a rubbish number to use. And that's because if you're returning minus one for scanf in particular, um, there is no way that you can scan in a negative number of things successfully or unsuccessfully. So that sort of number can't be something that can actually happen, which is why minus F is another thing that scanf returns. And what minus F minus one means is in one of those .h libraries that you use, so the standard input output library, and actually it exists in most of the libraries that C has, it's a hash define. So it will say that hash define is equal to um, EOF in capital letters, EOF, and that's the number is minus one. So what you're really checking when you're checking for this end of file is you're checking if scanf is equal to minus one. Um, and it's not always minus one, okay? It depends, different functions also have different things, but in the case of scanf, it's usually going to be that sort of minus one, but um, you can't ever rely, I saw Alvin actually answered a question on the forum about it, and you can't actually always rely on the fact it's going to be minus one. Um, so uh, it can be different things, but the hash defined for EOF is minus one, and it is, it means that you have gotten to the end of file, so you need to stop reading. And that's usually in the terminal, that's input as a control plus D. 
So if you press Control D, it will exit out of the whole thing, okay? Because it will hit an end of file. Um, that's how it knows that it's gotten there. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of notes. I uh, hope that wasn't too confusing. Let's try and do a loop so that we can actually see it in action. Okay, so let's do a little scan F. I was a tutor, okay. Thanks, Alvin. I thought I saw it on the forum. I thought I saw it somewhere and I thought, yes, that's very, very clever. So you can check for that end of file, um, but a really clever way is to check that it's returned the right number of things, in fact. So if we're scanning in, yeah, so EOF is a constant for minus one, basically. So there's a few different ways to do it. If you're going to search for EOF or if you're going to scan F, um, by two equal to one. So Shrey, I think you should also expand on that. It's not just not always, but it depends kind of which library you're in for what that hash define is. And in a lot of the standard libraries, it's defined um, as something else. And that's why we use the words EOF as our, um, as, as our check. Okay, because in different libraries, it might have something other than minus one. Okay, so let's, we've scanned in the direction um, and we want to uh, keep scanning in directions. Uh, we want to have it in a loop. We want to keep scanning in um, until we reach that lovely end of file, I think. What do you think? Let's try it out like that first. Okay. So two ways to do it. We can do it inside. Uh, so let's do inside the while loop. Sorry, Tom, I can't actually see because there's a lag on me seeing what you're typing. Yep, all right. So I'll put in a while loop around the printf and scanf. Yep. Alrighty. All right, so that's done. And note that I've included um, the printf, the scanf, all of those if statements and also print park at the end. Okay, excellent. So now all of that is sitting inside the while loop. But what should be the condition of our while loop? What do you guys reckon? Okay, so someone's saying while direction is not equal to one. Okay, so something is going to happen when you put that in, okay? So we've got direction is the variable that it scans in, okay? So what's going into direction, the variable, is it's going to have actually left or right or up or down. But yeah, so someone said, but we need to have whatever the result is of whatever scanf has returned to us. So if scanf has returned to us um, an end of file, then we want to stop, okay? So if we have... Yeah, and so someone's kind of said, yes, yeah, so scan f percent c n variable is equal to one, then we continue. Because what that means then is it means that we have checked that we have scanned in one item. So if it's equal to one, that means that you have actually scanned in one command perfectly. And what it means is that we're able to continue going if we have something to work with. So that's a really nice way to error check in there. So let's, let's go with that. So let's move the scanf statement inside the while condition. Alrighty, so we'll move that inside the while condition like that. I'll just get rid of that for a moment. So that's inside the while condition. Do I just need the scanf by itself or what else do I need? Well, you need to ask, you need to compare it to something. So otherwise, if you're just gonna be scanning in, you might be there a bit forever. So, and someone in the chat has placed the perfect option where you make it equal to one or you compare it, does it equal to one? Alrighty, so we've got scan f percent c direction equals equals one. Yeah, so while it's equal to one, which means, ah, and someone's picked it up. You guys are so good. People are picking up the mistakes. It's amazing, fantastic. So um, there's, so we've got like, we're scanning in a direction to start with. 
but we haven't got a prompt or anything. First of all, the user doesn't know what is going on. So can we please move the first printf, well, the only printf right now, outside of the while loop? Alrighty, we've moved it outside the while loop. And someone's asked, why is there a space before the percent %c? The space is there because we want to skip all the leading space, all the leading white space. So we want to skip any spaces or enters being pressed. Uh, we only want to read in the character, so the first character that appears that is a, a non-white space character. Okay, so now we have this lovely printf there. Where would Jacks like to go? We're saying left, right, left, right. Then we're doing a while loop. Should we try running it to see what it does? Alrighty. So let's save. We'll jump into the terminal again. I'll do a DCC. No errors, nice work. All right, then we'll run the program. All righty, so we're asked where would Jax like to go? Sasha, where do you think Jax wants to go? Uh, let's take Jax up. Up, all right, we use the U command. And look at that, okay, so Jax has moved up and now we've got an empty prompt, but it hasn't finished the program, it's just waiting. What should I do? Okay, so what does that mean do you guys reckon? This is clearly a problem in one of our lot because press U for us again, please, just to see what it does. U, enter. Well, so, okay, so it's printed out the um, the grid, but it's just waiting again for an input, I think. Okay, so we want to have really a printf at the bottom of our while loop as well that will ask the user again for the prompt. So after we print out the map, we want to ask again. Um, so. The reason we're going to have two printfs is because if we have it the first time um, outside of the while loop, then it actually takes in that first prompt. But we will also need that printf at the end. Okay, so let's pop a printf at the end as well. Already, that's done. Our while loop. Yep. Excellent. Let's save it and run it again just to see that it's doing what we wanted to do. Alrighty, so we've saved. Uh, we'll jump back into the terminal. How do I get out of this program? Because it's still waiting for input. This is where you might want to press Control D. Alrighty, so I'm going to hold down Control and press D. Look at that, my program just ended. Magical. And that's called an EOF. Perfect, alrighty. So uh, we'll run DCC again. Still no errors, good job. We'll run the command again. Alrighty, where would we like Jax to go? Let's go up, up, up three up. times already up again and wait for it up a third time already and Jax has moved three uh, zeros up it would look excellent fantastic okay so now we have this uh, lovely way that Jax can move around which is very nice we like to see him moving okay well what about uh, can we see where he's been already I think that would be quite handy to know wouldn't it Let's do that. So let's see, let's say basically uh, if he has been somewhere, we're going to change it to one. All right. No There's a lot of questions happening on the chat. Alvin, I uh, hope you're across them. I can see them scanning up. Okay. So let's, uh, let's put a one where Jax has been already. Okay. So that means we're going to modify our park map, okay? So what is the array where we are keeping, what is our initial array called that we are mapping, that we've initialized all to zeros? Tom, could you scan up a bit? I don't know what the array is called. Oh, yes, sure. It's called uh, park. Park. Okay, fantastic. Well, that's a clever name for a, for, a, for a variable. Okay, so we really want to then say wherever Jax has been, I want to make it equal to one. So wherever Jax is standing, that's now going to be one. So I'm going to modify my park array. So park. So inside my while loop, because uh, I'm moving inside the while loop as well. All right, where so, inside my while loop should I be modifying? Up the top or down the bottom or? Well, let's try at the top to start with. All right. And then we can think about if it's in the right position. Sure thing. Okay, so okay. we'll modify park. So park and then 
it's a two dimensional array. So we're going to have two sets of square brackets. Yeah. So we're going to have uh, first set is going to be the row and the second set of square brackets is going to be the column. So what that means is in the first set, we want to check where the dog is standing and where the dog is currently standing, we want to make that a one in the next movement. So let's then have it as position of the dog. So Jack's dot position uh, row. That's done. And the other one would be Jack's dot position column. Done as well, perfect. And what would you like them to be equal to? And I would like for it to be equal to one now. Alrighty, that's done too. Okay, let's save it and run it again. Alrighty, we'll save, we'll go into the terminal. I need to quit out of this program again, how do I do that? Control D. Control D, absolutely, alrighty. So we've done a control D now, we will now run DCC. No errors, we're on a roll here, dot slash JJ Park Adventure. Where would we like Jazz, uh, like Jax to go now? Let's go up. Alrighty, up. Ooh, interesting, and we saw a one. Where should we go now? Let's go up again. Up again. And we'll do it one more time just for good luck. Yep. Okay. So we can see now that the grid is changing. The part Okay, fantastic. Won. So now we're seeing all those ones as well. So now we know where we've already been and we can explore things like that. All right, let's do our boundary conditions and then we're going to uh, move on from this example kind of thing. So let's, let's do our boundary conditions now because really uh, you've noticed I've been going up or left because I can see that I can't really go to the right and I can't really go down. But I want to, you know, safe keep for that as opposed to just me doing it where I know it will work. So let's do um, let's do our let's do some gatekeeping. Okay, so if we're on the boundaries of our grid, okay, so if we are um, up at the very top, if I'm standing at nine nine, okay, already I can see that I can't move down and I can't move to the right. So I need to check for my boundary conditions because I don't want Jax to come out of the park. So if Okay, so let's say we've taken in our location and we've decreased. Uh, so we've got our if statements that say if direction is equal to left, then we're going to decrease the column. If position, you know, if, if position is equal to up or down, then we'll decrease or increase the row. So after we do that, we really want to check, are we going to go outside of this park uh, or we can stop doing it before we even get to. So in those if statements, we need to have another set of boundary, well, not boundary, another set of if statements that checks from the boundary conditions. So if Jack's position row is going to be less than zero, which means that we're standing in the very corner, in the left-hand corner, or we're just standing, not particularly in the corner, on the edge of the park where I would walk into minus one after that, but there is no such thing as minus one. Would you like it inside the if statement or below the if statement? Where exactly are we thinking we're going to add this? Let's go. Uh, let's go below the if statement to start with. Alrighty. So below the if statement, we'll add another if statement separately. Uh, and what would you like the condition to be? And the condition. Let's have it. If Jack's uh, position row is less than zero. That's done. What should happen if the position is less than zero? So if the position is less than zero, uh, I'm going to call Jax and tell him to stand in the same place. So his position off row is going to be still equal to zero. So if if we've gone into the negatives, I'm just going to say Jax dot position row is equal to zero still. So he's not going to move anywhere, basically, is what I'm saying. He's a very well trained dog. Alrighty, Jax will never have a position row left less than zero, it looks like. Very well Excellent. trained dog indeed. And I guess this is going to also apply for us for the column as well. So else if his column position is less than zero, so I don't want that also, that's going to hit the boundary into the negative numbers, which don't exist for my indexing. So else if Jack's dot position column is less than zero. Yep. Jack's dot pos equals zero. Yep, then 
I'm going to have his jacks dot position column is equal to zero. Okay, so now what are my other conditions? Yes, so Theo's got it, excellent. The next one is jacks dot um, position row is going to be uh, greater than nine or actually what's the size of our array? We've got a hash defined, don't we? We do indeed. So the hash define is up here somewhere. We've got this. the hash define is the number of rows. Alrighty. So what we can do is instead of saying nine, we can say n underscore rows. Yeah. Alrighty. And in that case, what should we do? And in that case, uh, we're going to again. So if we're standing at nine, we can't go to ten because there is no index 10, we want to keep staying at nine. So that means that we want to have our jacks dot position row is equal to n rows minus one. So that means we're staying the size of the array minus one, which will bring me back to that index. Alrighty, so we've got else if jacks dot pos row is greater than n rows, jacks dot pos row equals n rows minus one. Does that sound right to you? Yep, and then let's do the same for the column, except for check if Jack's position column is greater than n number of columns. Alrighty, let's do that. Alrighty, that's done as well. Okay, so a few people have also noticed uh, a uh, potential mistake? No, I never make mistakes. What are you talking about? Never, never. never. It's the sunglasses. Exactly. What, how could a guy wearing sunglasses make mistakes? I don't understand. Absolutely. So let's remember that n rows is actually equal to 10. So n rows minus one is gonna bring us back down to nine, which is okay. But we're checking if Jax's position is greater than the number of rows, which means that he has to be greater than um, he has to be greater than 10, yeah? Which doesn't particularly make sense because that's going to be very hard to do. So what should it be? And we, yes, we can definitely put these inside the other if statements. I just wanted to move them out so we can just play on them to start to, to go. You know what, let's just run it so that everyone can see what happens. Alrighty, so I'll save the file. I'll jump into my terminal again. I'm gonna quit out. Was that control D? Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Uh -huh. uh, all right, we'll compile the program. No errors. And then dot slash JJ Park Adventure. Okay, where would we like Jax to go, Sasha? Uh, I think Jax should go down. Down, alrighty. Down. Where's Jax? He's lost. He's hidden. There's no J on the map. There's no J on the map. How rude. J has gone off the map. Okay, so what's happened there? There's clearly a mistake in our code, and a few of you have been able to spot a little mistake. So, where was that mistake? If we can go back to the code and fix it. Alrighty, so we're back in the code now. And yeah. where was the mistake? So people are saying if Jack's position row is greater than or equal to the number of rows, because the boundary conditions are after the moving ones. Alrighty, so we've made both, uh, both of those, the third and fourth if statement, they're now greater than or equal to. Okay, excellent. Should we try that now? Alrighty, so we'll save that. Once again, control D, and then we'll compile. There we go, we've compiled. And then we'll dot slash JJ Park Adventure. Where do we want Jax to go? Let's have Jax go down again, since we saw that that doesn't give us the right output. Jax hasn't moved. Fantastic, that's exactly what we want. We want a good boy that doesn't move when told to run outside the park. All right, so that's kind of like a very sort of simplified version of moving around and you'll be doing a lot of moving around 
um, in your game with your farmer, your farmer's going to be moving around. So remember, always good to draw the, the grid so that you can actually see, um, you know, how it's all happening and you can actually see, uh, you know, where the numbers will be increasing or decreasing. It's much easier to visualise it in that sort of way. Okay, so someone has asked, wait a second, why do we set it to uh, greater than or equal to? So Tom, could you please, uh, before, when you go back to the code, could you please go to that section of code and write a comment for us what it's actually comparing in numerical values? Absolutely, I can. So um, we'll write in the comment that says that we know that Jack's pause row is gonna be um, the position of the dog. So Jax's row, but yeah. it's greater than or equal to what is n rows? n rows, if we have a look at the hash define, which is up the top here, n rows is 10. Yeah. So we'll go back down and write that in the comment. n rows is 10. So we're asking if Jax's row is greater than or equal to 10. Um, now, um, it might be worth saying that the other way that it, some people might think of it differently, what we're really doing here is we're asking if Jax's row is greater than nine. So if you think about it, greater than or equal to 10, it's the same thing as being greater than nine. And that's important because nine is the last row that Jax can be in. So I'll leave it as greater than or equal to 10. But if in your head you're thinking, I don't get, really get that, try thinking about it as greater than nine or greater than n rows minus one. Yeah. And if you notice the first set of if statements, we have already moved jacks. So if the direction was down, which on line 78 means that we increase our row, that means Jax's row is now nine plus one. So Jax's row at line 87 is actually 10. So what we would be comparing is, is 10 greater than 10? And then nothing was happening. And that's why we put in the equal sign as well there, because then it's, is 10 greater than or equal to 10? we've gone off the edge. Mm -hmm. So the, you see how the code will modify and it, and it might always be like that, depending where you're putting these if statements. And the reason I put the if statements outside is to show you that this is the kind of error that you might be able to get. So you have to always think, what am I doing above it? What's this value going to be before you actually, you know, are able to compare. And sometimes a really good way to do it is to you know comment out write down what you think the values should be or what they are actually going to be so if that if statement was inside the other if statement if it was nested then that would not be the same condition that we would potentially be comparing because we would know we would not allow the dog to move from nine to a ten but because we've allowed that shift to already happen we've already gone from nine to ten that's why um, underneath we have to compare ten to a ten one thing. Right. That, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, Tom. I was just oh. going to say um, one thing. One thing that can often be helpful here. So this code is is live. You can go and grab it yourself. If you want, if you're confused by it after the lecture, why not grab a copy of the code and put in some printf statements? See what the value of row and column are up here on line 71, maybe on line 81 as well, and then again on line 93, and see can you see why you know maybe one of those if statements happens or doesn't happen? That could be a really good way of getting a better handle on it if you're still kind of confused about what's going on. Yeah, and next week in the Tuesday lecture, we're actually going to be shoving printf statements everywhere to show you how to debug things nicer. So that that will fit in nicely with that. All right, so I think now is a good time to have a little break. Uh, let's do a five minute break and then we will come back and we will uh, have a look at, uh, we'll do an introduction to pointers. Yay. All right. So I'll see you guys in five minutes. Ready one moment.
Wait, wait, wait. All right, we're back. I see people are having a few questions uh, about the riddle. Um, there is a more optimal solution than 10 questions. Uh, you can get it down to seven questions to figure it out. But yeah, people are, yes. You've got to make use of all of the three types of possibilities. So let's say the first question would be, um, I'm thinking of a number between 333 and 666. Is your number smaller? than mine. And then if I reply yes, then you know that the number's between one and 332. If you if I reply no, then you know that the number's between um, 667 and 1000. And if I reply, I don't know, then you know that the number is between 333 and 666. So you kind of keep reducing the amounts down um, into thirds each time. And that will, once you start shrinking the intervals, Mathematically, you'll be able to get it down to about seven questions. How exciting. Um, all right, let's, uh, okay. Let me introduce you to pointers. 
I wish, Tom, you had some music cued that would be like angels descending from the heavens. That wasn't the music I was thinking of getting ready, but okay. Yes, we can absolutely have some. Yeah, that's what I want because, yeah, pointers are. Oh, thank you, Alvin. Alvin has got a halo now. That's, yeah. Oh, since I'm the person introducing pointers, yeah, I'm going to go halo as well because pointers are everything except you can't see my halo because i have a white cupboard behind me anyway the halo is very strong hey oh never mind all right so basically pointers um it's pointers are amazing okay they actually are amazing okay people might disagree with me but I truly think, and, and this is part of the reason that we learn C as well, because we have this wonderful thing called pointers. It allows you to have a very, very intimate look into what the computer is doing and how computer memory is working, um, which is, you know, quite nice. Uh, you know, you guys are on the introduction to computing stage. It's time that you build up your relationship with the computer. So you kind of are starting to be like, I want to know, want to know more about your memory so let's do it so what is a pointer right do not get freaked out a pointer is just another type of variable okay but this pointer it points okay what does it point to what on earth is a pointer that points so a pointer is a point is another variable but what it stores inside it is a memory address of a variable okay so it points that memory address then points to another variable and i'll draw it up okay so that it's so that it's a lot more obvious what's going on okay but this is quite powerful because what it means is that you can modify things directly at the source so if you have the memory address of something and you make changes at that memory address you're actually modifying it you know straight in there um and so uh, that kind of also, I guess, has certain implications for functions as well, and some quite neat applications for functions, um, because up until now, uh, we've sort of been returning a few little things, but now you can see the sort of the bigger picture, maybe at the end of today and next week, you can see the bigger picture um, of what you can, you know, the potential is, is so big. Okay, so what is, how do you declare a pointer? So a pointer is declared by using this type of uh, lovely syntax here. So the star is what's telling me that I'm going to have a pointer. Int is the data type that the pointer points to. And the pointer is my variable name, okay? So really you're declaring it in the same way that you declare any other variable. But to say that it's a pointer, we have that little star. So I'm really, I'm going to draw it up for you now uh, so that you can kind of see um, where I'm going with this and what a pointer really means. Okay, so let's move to this blank screen and we're going to go from this blank screen. Okay, so let's say I have uh, a few different variables. Okay, so let's say I have Not that, I did not mean to do that um, because I've forgotten to switch on my drawing. Okay, so let's say I have an int and my variable name is called box and I've assigned the number six to it, yeah? So what I have is I have this variable here um, and it's got the number six placed inside it, okay? Now this box is sitting at a certain place on a table and this is going to be a non three dimensional table. I'm sorry, that's the best that I can do right now. So it occupies some sort of physical location on my table. Okay, let's then say I have, I don't know, I can have many more boxes sitting on this table. I can have another box and I can assign a different value to it. Now let's say that I want to be able to kind of get in inside these boxes and I want to do a pointer to this box. So now let's say I've got a pointer. So the pointer is pointing to a type int because inside this box, I'm going to point to this box here. And inside this box is the number six, which is an int. So my pointer is going to be of type int. 
And I'm going to do a little star to say that it's going to be a pointer. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to be, call it a box pointer. And remember, this is just a variable name. It could be absolutely anything. Now, when I remember that a pointer inside it stores the variable address. Now you've used scanf and you've used this wonderful symbol in scanf that was the ampersand. So you might remember that we talked in week one that what it means is place it into that address. So whenever you have a pointer, what you assign to it is you, oh, you can't see my, oh, it's completely cut off. I see what you're saying. Why is it cut off? Okay, I'm gonna do it down here. Okay, this is my inbox is equal to six. This is my inbox two is equal to 11. And now I'm gonna do a pointer to this box. So I'm gonna do int, and then I'm gonna have a star. I'm gonna have a box pointer, which is the name of my pointer. And remember now that you use this ampersand in scanf, which gave you the address of. Whenever I have a pointer, what I'm storing in the pointer is the address of something. So I'm going to point it to the address of box. So I'm going to use the ampersand to say address of, and then I'm going to use box, which is pointing me to the address of this box. So I have access to be able to go into this box. So basically what happens is box over here is the value. So it's basically saying uh, what the value is. And in a pointer, you really have to remember three different things that are the most important, okay? So we will use this star to open up the box and it's called dereferencing a pointer, which means that if I have this, no, this is not making much sense. I'm going too far into it. You know what, Tom, can you please go to a, a G edit? please. I'm going to do it in a piece of code so you can see it first. And then I'm going to talk you through it with a picture. Absolutely. I was just getting an ASCII diagram ready, but I can get rid of that if we don't want it. Um, so I've gone over to the code. You can take a look at the ASCII diagram and you can tell me whether we want to get rid of it or not. But while you take a look, I'll just write in the usual code stuff. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good God. A proper little box. Let's let's just do a really simple little piece of code that shows it, and then we'll fill in the boxes because that will make a lot more sense. Sounds good. All right, so we've okay. got the main function. So we've got the main function. So Tom, could you please now for me um, declare this lovely so int box is equal to six. Alrighty. That's done. It's done. Okay. On the next line, I want you to declare a pointer. So could you please write a comment that we're declaring a pointer and pointing it to the address of box? Comment written. What do we want to call that okay. pointer? And then the pointer is going to be called, so the pointer is pointing to a type of int. Um, so it's going to be int star, and the pointer is going to be called box underscore PTR, box pointer. Already that's done. Okay. And I'm going to make it equal to the address of box. So I'm going to use the ampersand signal symbol to say I want the address of box. So a pointer is just a variable type that stores an address of the variable. So I can't assign just plain box to it. I have to assign the address of box. All right. Okay. And now we're going to, uh, and now we, I'm going to show you the three different things you can do with pointers. Can you please go to the next line and we're going to print out. Okay, what are we printing out? Okay, printf please. Yep. Uh, in uh, inverted commas, the value of the variable box located at address percent %p is percent %d, new line. Okay. So you will know, you will notice that I'm using a whole new format specifier, percent %p. And you're going to go, what on earth is percent %p? Percent %p doesn't even make sense. What does it stand for? Percent %p is what happens when you want to access a memory. So when you want to type out, not type out, print out a memory address. Okay, so that's what percent %p is useful. So Tom, could you please comment in the code what that percent %p is doing? Because it's the first time we've seen a percent %p. 
Absolutely. And yeah, so as Shrey said in the chat, do not freak out, okay? The best thing about pointers is once you start using them, they make a lot more sense. But really just keep in the back of your mind, a pointer is a variable that stores an address of another variable. But the pointer itself still has a memory address itself as well, right? So it's all kind of building up like it's just another variable. It's just that it's a specific variable. It only stores memory addresses. Okay, so now when we print out, okay, so if you put a comma, the first one we want is the, um, we want the actual memory address. And I want to show the memory address of my pointer, okay? So let's have the memory address. Okay. Sorry, no, the value of the variable box located, okay, no. Uh, we want the address of box, so and box to access the address, and you'll notice again, so whenever I want the address, I use the ampersand symbol. So if I use the ampersand symbol, type box afterwards, that will give me the address of the box. Okay, and then comma. And then I'm going to have, I want to be able to see what is inside the box. Okay, so I want whatever is actually sitting inside the box. Now, my pointer is pointing to this box. So I'm going to do what's called dereference a pointer. So whenever you use an address, you get the address off. Whenever you use a star, you're dereferencing it. So you're opening up the box to see what's inside the box, okay? So could you please type in star box pointer? Absolutely, that's done. Okay, thank you so much. Now, could you please run this piece of code so that we can see what it's giving us? Absolutely, okay. So we'll jump, we'll save our code first of all. We'll jump back into the terminal, we'll run DCC, but this time we've got a new file. So we're gonna output a thing called pointers and we're gonna compile it from pointers.c. There we go, it looks like it compiled just fine. Let's now run dot slash pointers. And see what and we in get. this course, we're never going to do pointers to pointers to pointers to pointers. We're only looking at one level of pointers, so you don't need to you don't need to do crazy mental games uh, where you uh, figure out who's pointing to what. Okay, so what have we got as our printout? The value of the variable box located at address, and it's giving us a certain address, is six, which is exactly what we have as the value of that variable. So the three points to remember is we use the ampersand symbol and we use it to be uh, to give us an address. So give me address of box. We use the star symbol to open the box at a particular address and see what is inside that box, okay? But with a pointer, exactly the same way as in any variable, you have to um, declare it first you have to initialize it um, and then you might you might have the star to access what's inside it and so on and so forth and out of that absolutely you could just type in box um, but i'm just showing you what a box pointer does but you could type box it would give you six but you'll see the usefulness of this when we move on to talking about functions okay um sasha yeah uh, so you mentioned that there were three things. Would it be all right if we made some comments just to explain exactly what those three things are? Because I think we've got yes. two of them written down. So the first one, the first thing that we need to remember is this idea of making a pointer. And so that's what this int star means. It's good to think about int star as being one thing. It's not int and then you know, star box pointer. It's just int star. An int star is just like int or double or struct something int star is just another way of talking about a variable type. It's just that in this case, we call that type a pointer. The second thing is this address of operator, which is the ampersand. And what that means is, uh, how did you describe it, Sasha? So we initialize a pointer. We assign an address of a variable with the ampersand. So let's have one declaring a pointer, which is what we normally do, pointing at the address of box. Yep. And number two, we initialize it we assign the address of, um, to the variable with the ampersand symbol. And then the third one is going to be dereferencing a pointer. So using that star, 
go to the address that this pointer is pointing to and find out what is at that address. So actually open the box, have a look in it, dig out whatever's sitting in the box. Alrighty. And so we can see that the third thing down here, just so that it's clear for everyone, or you use this ampers sorry, we use this uh, asterisk here to mean go into box pointer, open it up and grab the thing out. And it's probably useful to mention like this asterisk and this asterisk here aren't the same thing. So there's this one, which is always next to, you know, int or double or something like that, talking about a pointer type. And there's this one down here, which is talking about a particular, uh, going inside a particular pointer. Um, okay. Cool. Tom, could you please return to my screen? Because then I'm, I've got some diagrams to, uh, that are much nicer to go over what's going on. There you go. Back on your screen. We can't. Like back on my screen? Yes, we are. Okay. So let's let's go through it visually. Okay. So we've got our int box is equal to six. Let's say we have our little stack of memory and we're placing this box is equal to six into a memory address that let's just say zero X F F 40. Okay. These are just made up, made up addresses. Okay. To demonstrate a point, they mean uh, nothing. This is not how memory is structured. This is really just to show you what's going on. Okay, so this is my normal address, uh, sorry, my normal variable, it's equal to six, it's gone into a memory address. Um, what happens then? Then we did a variable, okay? And the variable was a pointer. So it was the first part of a pointer, we declared an instar, and then we called it box pointer, and we pointed it to the address of the box. So what that means is that this pointer now here, the box pointer, holds the address of wherever this box six is. So it holds uh, this address that is in here. So zero X FF 40 is going to go in here now. Okay, then when we print stuff out, what we're saying here is um, the address of box pointer and uh, in, this is actually an incorrect arrow, I'm sorry, because the box pointer has its own address. That should just say box. And the box, the address of the box is in here and it should have an and. So let me just correct that. So that should say and box. And then and box points to this. And my pointer with the star means show me what is sitting at this address. Because what was at this address is this variable here. That means that six is my dereference pointer. So six is what's sitting inside that box that I am looking at. Okay, all right. And you can have different types of, you can have pointers to different types of variables, right? So you can have pointers to ints, you can have pointers to doubles, you can have pointers to chars as well. Um, it's not, you can have different types as long as you match when you declare your pointer you match it to the type that it's pointing to. So the address should be off the type that, is, that it's actually holding. So if it's holding the address of an int, then that pointer type is an int. If it's holding an address of a double, then it should be uh, a double pointer. Okay. Um, okay, let's talk about a very special value of a pointer called null which is how you really can break things. Um, Tom, could you please go back to gedit? We're back in gedit now. What would you like to do? Thank you so much. Okay, so sometimes we want to be able to initialize a pointer and uh, you know we have nothing to initialize it with. We haven't assigned anything to it. And so we give it this value called null, okay? And null is a special, uh, Again, it's another special word in C, so it sits in your hash define. The value of it is basically zero, but you know, things can change, which is why we use the actual word, constant word null, okay? So can we please, Tom, make our, uh, make our box pointer point to null? So if we have our declared box pointer on line nine, can we please make it equal to null? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I've done it at the bottom, but what I'll do is I'll move that, I'll replace the code that we've already got and we'll say instead of box pointer equal ampersand box, 
we'll make it equal to null. Yep. On line 11. Okay. And then let's see what happens if you try. So if we think about it, we've initialized our pointer to null, okay? Which means that it's actually, there's nothing happening. Um, it's not really pointing to any address. It has no address to go off at all. So what do you reckon happens if we try and ask it to go to the address that is stored in this pointer? It's going to go, okay, uh, it wants me to go to the address of null, which is an address in, you know, magic fairyland that doesn't exist. Uh, it's going to break, it's going to break things. It's, it's really going to break things. Can we please see the DCC what it does? Because it's a very special type of error. Absolutely, we can. Uh, so I've run DCC again. No warnings, no errors. So it looks like everything's going to be fine. But I feel like I can hear the Jaws music in the background. So I'm going to do yeah. dot slash pointers. And see, it does compile no problem, okay? Which is which is what is even more chaotic about it. But if you have a look, we've now got a runtime error accessing a value via a null pointer on line okay. 16. Can you please highlight that error for us, Tom, so we can see exactly where it is? Absolutely. So it's Okay. Yeah. yeah. As as you go on in this course, especially in the later weeks after flexibility weeks, you will get very familiar with this error, okay? Because there's going to be a few times where you're going to be pointing things uh, where there is nothing there, okay? So what's happened is you've tried to access something at a memory location that doesn't exist, okay? Which is why it's it's screaming at you, okay? It's that's why it's crashing. That's why it's just not happy at all. So you are you there is nothing there for you to access, but you're still trying to access it. And the way that you've done that is when you've done star and box pointer. So if you go back to the code, Tom, and highlight the point at which this break has happened. Absolutely. So we can see that it's right here at character 81 on line 16. And it's worth yeah. noting even that the error told us, we have a look at the error, it says pointers.c line 16 character 81, which is right here. So when we tried to dereference the pointer, when we said to it, okay, could you please go to this address? And that's what the star means. Go to this address and get me what's inside that address. Okay. You can't go to the address of nothing. There is nothing. That's not an address. There's nothing there. So this is one of the sort of biggest problems you can have with pointers is that you access these, these null pointers and it, it creates you know, well, huge issues, chaos, crashing, uh, you know, basic, just basic yesterday technical problem vibes. So, um, yeah, so definitely be very careful of that. Be wary that this is a problem that does occur quite a lot at all. Um, okay, uh, Tom, could you please share my, s no, hang on, not yet. Okay. So you ask, what would be the point of this pointer business? I could have just written box, someone says, and, and it's very true. I could have just written box, couldn't have I, um, instead of writing this box pointer business. There is a purpose to pointers, okay? So if you, uh, Tom, if you can share my screen You're already now. already shared, please. yep. Oh, you've already shared, mm -hmm. okay. All right, and I'll show you what we've talked about. I threw this little Perla at you when we were doing uh, our first look at functions. And so now I'm hoping maybe I can bring it together uh, without using the terms. I'm going the wrong way. Apologies. Uh, still the wrong way. Here we go. Okay. So um, I really love this demonstration. Okay. So if you can have a look, what happens is um, here we have that we are passing a, a cup here. And this is the way that we've been doing it so far. We pass a variable to our function, okay? And what I've said to you is that, that that's not exactly the same thing when it goes to that function. We make a copy of it. So it's like you're passing the cup over, you're making a copy of the cup and you're filling up this cup. But if you notice, it's not filling up the initial cup, okay? So this is where pointers come in. If you pass a pointer to a function, what it's doing is it's actually changing it at the source as well. So because we know the address, we can access what is inside that address and we can make changes to it straight away, okay? So that has some interesting implications for us in that we are, you know, 
we might not be making copies of variables and then passing the results back to our function. We're actually making changes straight away. And this is useful in a few different situations. Um, sometimes if you've noticed, we've only ever returned one thing. We've only ever returned at one particular result or we've only ever returned one particular number. What happens if I need to return two numbers? What do I do then? You know, how do I, how do I make that happen? And if you've noticed as well, we can't return an array. So that's another uh, situation where we, you know, might need to do something without, you know, returning a whole array. And we'll talk about arrays and pointers in a second. I shouldn't have brought an array into the mix right now. Um, so I don't want to bring it into the mix. I'm going to subtract the array. So basically a pointer allows you to pass, if you pass a pointer to uh, a function, what happens is that you can make changes to the original variable because you know its address. So you can make things happen at the actual address of where it's sitting. Um, Tom, could you please go back to code? Because we're going to demonstrate that. Alrighty, we're back in code. What would you like me to do? All right, I think what I want to do is I'm going to, I'm going to add two numbers up. No, Alrighty. I'm going to, Hmm? Oh, I'm going to know. I was going to increment a number. Let's do it without with let's do it without pointers at first and then we'll do it with pointers uh, after that. Absolutely. Would you like this in a new file? Yes, let's please have a new file. Alrighty. Uh, one thing I'm just gonna do for one moment is I'm gonna make sure that everybody can see that new file. So you don't need to worry about the exact command that I'm doing. Uh, but if I do that and then I also do um, pointers.c. All this is doing is just making it so that everybody here can look at the code that we've just done. So we'll make a new file. We'll call it pointers intro.c with an ampersand at the end. We'll just double check that everyone can see that. Yes, they can. We'll hash include stdio.h. We'll also in main void as we've done so many times so far. I'll even chuck in a return zero. Um, what would you like to do, Sasha? Thank you, Tom, for asking. Um, I would like to have, uh, you've got your int main void, okay? I would like to have a variable for number, please. So let's say int number. Okay, that's done. Okay, and then I'm going to have a printf statement that says enter number to increment. And then I'm going to scan f percent d. Alrighty, scan f percent d into the number variable. And so you guys have already really been using this concept of a pointer from day dot, which is super exciting because you've all been using scanf. And if you've noticed, we scan f into the address of the variable because otherwise, how do we know where it's going into? So you have been using that ampersand sim symbol without kind of really fully understanding it. So in fact, you know, there's nothing to be scared of when you do pointers because you've already been using them for four weeks, okay? So you've scanned into the address of the number, okay? And now, Tom, could you please do a printf statement that says the original number is percent %d number? Yep, I'll do that now. Alrighty. Thank you. And then we're going to have, oh, why not? Let's have a function because we're demonstrating pointers and functions. So we're gonna do it without pointers to start with, okay? And then we're gonna see how pointers can improve things for us. And remember, this is a very simple um, function as well. Okay, I'm gonna put the function down the bottom. What would you like to call this function? I'm gonna call the function increment. And Already. now, if you notice, Tom has got int... Uh, yep, so it says increment. Increment, okay, thank you. So he's got int because we're going to be returning an integer from this function, okay? And we're going, what should we give to this function? We need to give it the number that we want to increment, don't we? So it's going to have another int, whatever the number is that we give it. All righty, we'll call it int num, maybe. Yeah. Perfect, okay. What would you like to put inside this function, Sasha? And inside this function, can I please return num plus one? Turn num plus one, done. Okay, and then after your printf statement on line 10, can I please call this function with the variable number? 
Alrighty, so we're gonna call increment with the variable number, semicolon at the end, done. Okay, so let's see this uh, uh, actually, and then after we call that function, can we please have a printf statement that says the incremented number is percent D. Oh, we haven't stored it anywhere, that's unfortunate. Would you like to store it somewhere or would you yes, like to? Yes, please let's do int new number is equal to increment. Alrighty. Int new number equals increment. Do you want to print out the number is now number or the number is now new number or both? Uh, the number is now incremented to or something like that. All right, incremented to, and then we'll print out new number. Yep, okay, let's run this piece of code. All righty, so we'll jump back in the terminal, dcc o pointers intro, pointers intro dot c, Oh, I've done something interesting there. Dash O pointers intro, pointers intro dot C. I'm not sure what's happened there. Oh, well done. Oh. Someone's missed a prototype. Oh, yes, indeed, I have missed a prototype. The other thing I'll do is I'll do that. Hold on. Let me fix that up as well. Sorry, this is also ha has to do with um, the issue intro there. Let's recompile. There we go. Now it's complaining. Yes, indeed, I've missed out on my increment function. So let's make a prototype. I'll just copy Excellent. the prototype here, paste it up the top there, and we'll save and rerun. Uh, where are we going? So DCC again, no errors that time. Nice work. We run such a roll. Oh well. Uh, dot slash pointers intro. Yeah. Enter number to increment. What number do we like? Uh, let's, I don't know, choose a number, any number, pick a number. 42. Oh, the meaning of life, indeed. indeed. Alrighty, so enter number to increment. We said 42. The original number is 42, and the number is now incremented to 43. Oh, amazing. It works like a charm. Um, so Melvin's asked a good question. Why is the input int num instead of int number? It can be int number. Um, it doesn't matter because remember when we pass, if you go back to the code, um, yep, Tom, done. In, and so that you can highlight what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. if you can highlight the input, Remember that when we pass a variable over to our function, so when, when I'm passing, when I call the function on line 14 and pass the variable number to it, what happens is the actual, it, a clone of it goes, it makes a copy of it and a copy of it goes. So I could call it int number and that int number on line 21 wouldn't be the same as the number that I'm calling from the main function, okay? And this is, this is where pointers kind of come to the rescue because it is, uh, you are then actually making changes to the one and the same variable. It's, it's, yeah. it's worth saying that the way that this actually works is you can imagine that on line 14, when we call increment, we replace number with the actual number 42. And so yeah. we're just calling increment 42 here. So num equals yeah. 42. Yeah. Cool. So when you call that increment 42, the 42 goes in whatever variable you have in your function. Okay. So it's not you're not actually modifying the number. All right, so now what I would like to do is I would like to redo this, but with pointers. All right. Yeah, yes, that's right. If we used a pointer, we'd actually change the original variable. We don't need to return anything either when we do it with pointers, okay? Can I suggest maybe it might be useful just to, to illustrate that to do a quick intermediate step, which is just to note, that if I change this int to a void and yeah. I don't return anything, I just set num equals yes, to num plus idea. one. So I'm just gonna get rid of uh, new number. We're just gonna call increment for a moment and we're gonna call it on number. Something weird is gonna happen here, isn't it, Sasha? Yes, so now, so as you can see, Tom, what Tom's done is he's not returning anything from that function, but he's calling that function and then he's trying to print different things out. So let's see what it does if he does that. All let's right. remember that this function doesn't return anything. It's just going to increment that num is equal to num plus one. And if you remember, it's going to be a copy of whatever the number is. So let's see what happens. So I've made a slight error here because it says that we've got conflicting types for increment. You might wonder, what does that mean? Well, if you look at line 21, I've said that increment is a void function, but if you look at line three, I've said it's an int function and C says that doesn't make sense. So I'm just gonna change it so that they're both void functions, which is what we wanted. We'll go back into the terminal now, and now we'll run dcc o pointers intro, pointers intro dot C. We'll run dot slash pointers intro. 
pick a number, let's say uh, 102. But weirdly, we entered the number 102, the original number is 102, the number is now incremented to 102. Yeah. Weird. So, yeah, well, weird, but also it's doing exactly what you've told it to do. Um, so weird for us, but not weird for what it's doing exactly what it needs to be doing. Because uh, if you go back to your code, please, thank you yep. so much. When I've called my function increment number, um, I've called it for really, I said increment 102. It went down to the function increment. That function increment returns nothing to us. And also uh, it's now num. So num is now equal to 42. So now num is now equal to 43 from that function, but I'm not returning anything uh, to the main function. So my number is still really 102. Sorry, I've just gone back to 40s. And so when on line 16, I printed out again, my number hasn't actually changed values. Um, the num in a different function changed values, but it had absolutely no implications to my main function. So now let's do, um, let's do it using pointers now. Alrighty, so what do I need to change? Okay, so after your number, when you've got your int number, could we please uh, declare a pointer? So could you please write a comment that you're declaring a pointer? Yes, indeed. Declare. And pointing it to the address of number. Pointing to the address of number, absolutely. Alrighty, and how do I do that? Okay. Now, my pointer is pointing to a type int, so it's going to be an int star. Yep. And let's call it number underscore PTR, so number pointer. Alrighty, that's done. And we're going to make it equal to the address of number. So we're going to place the address of number into this variable type, into this pointer variable. Alrighty, so we've used the ampersand to do that. Yep. Perfect. Okay. And so now uh, we've got our number. And now what I would like to do is when we increment our, when we have on line 16, where we're incrementing our number, I would like to send the function a pointer instead. All right. So on line 16, could you please input a pointer into my function? So I'm going to input number underscore pointer. Sure thing. And so note that you don't need to do a star and you don't need to do an ampersand when you're doing the number pointer. Yep. I suppose because the ampersand up here, if you imagine in the simplest terms, it's kind of like we're saying ampersand number down here. We're just using number pointer. We're providing it the location yeah. of number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so now when we go down to our function down below, please, where's yep. 23? So line 23 in our function, mm -hmm. we're now not giving it an int num. The input is now going to be a pointer. So it's going to be an int star. Right. So let's change that to int star. Yep, done. And then the name, okay. And then if you can increase, so if we want to increase what is uh, the, at the address that the pointer is pointing to. So we're not increasing the pointer itself, okay? Because the pointer itself holds a memory address. We don't want to do anything with that memory address. We want to go to that memory address and increase the number that is sitting inside that memory address. So we would dereference that pointer and we would dereference it by using the star. So we say, please go to this address. Yep, so we've got a star in front of num. So we're saying, num equals star num plus one. Yeah. What have you got? Sorry, I missed what so you said. So I'm saying num equals star num plus one. So we're dereferencing num on the right-hand side and adding one to it. Is that all I need to do? Okay. Well, what do you, what do you reckon? What do you, what, um, has it caught up yet? I can't see what you've done. No, it's caught up now. Cool. Okay. So now what we have is that num is going to be equal to, if you dereference what's sitting inside that pointer, which is whatever the number is, plus one, so it's going to increment it, then what's going to happen now? Should we have a look? Do we want to give it a try? We can compile it and see what happens. Let's see what happens when we compile it. When we compile it, we get a warning. It says incompatible integer to pointer conversion assigning int star from int. And it gives us that warning on line 24. So How? Yep. Incredibly magical. 
So what do we think? And, and so can you highlight that error so that we can see, because you'll become familiar with this error as well. Absolutely, so the error is here, pointers intro.c, line 24, character number nine, warning incompatible integer to pointer conversion. It's right there. Okay, so what do we think is happening there? And, it, and, and the error is kind of telling you what's happening as well, yeah? Assigning to int star from int. Yeah, it's cut off a bit, but it says assigning to int star from int there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So someone's got it on the chat. Well done. Uh, and someone's got on how to fix it as well. Okay, so we want to have a star in front of that initial num as well, because we want to um, be actually modifying the dereference value. So Tom, could you please go back to the code? Yep, that's done. And we've added oh. a star in front of num at the start of the line. So we're saying star num equals yep. star num plus one. Excellent. All right, let's try and run it now. Absolutely. And notice as well that this function is still void. I'm not returning anything from this function, okay? Oop, we've got another one of those conflicting types errors, which are, we'll, we'll become all too familiar with without the course. But if you remember what I did last time, I looked at my m function here, which is a void increment int star num. If I look up here on line three, it's only a void increment int num. They don't make sense together. So we've got to add an extra star in on line three so that this prototype and this actual function match. Yeah. We'll save that now. We'll run compile uh, again. Alrighty, that compiled this time. Should we run it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Pick a number. We'll pick 42 again. The original number is 42. The number is now incremented to 43. Ooh. And you'll notice we haven't returned anything. Uh, we haven't, we don't need an extra variable either to run the function with to hold a return value in. We've simply modified it at the source. So we've modified it at its address. So this is, you know, kind of where pointers really shine. Uh, this is also where you enter uh, a lot of compiler errors sometimes. But when you see these errors, don't freak out. It just, just read the top one, you know, make a change and then run it again and then see what that does. Because sometimes the first one leads to a whole bunch of, uh, you know, errors down below as well. You've got to follow the example of your tutors. Don't don't freak out. Just be cool. Put on some sunglasses. You'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the more sort of, of these errors you see, the more you will understand what it actually wants you to do. And and in fact, compiler errors are the often the easiest ones to fix because it's really kind of directing you where to fix. The hardest ones to fix are when it compiles fine, but it doesn't actually work like you want it to. Those are the much harder errors to find. Uh, so, Tom, someone's saying your sunglasses are hiding your tears. <laughs> what tears? Tears of joy. They're tears oh, of joy. Or I'm just inspired by these pointers. And I, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. They're, okay. They're, it's truly inspirational. It is. I agree. All right. I would like to demonstrate one more uh, thing. Okay. Already. And, and don't worry. Also, next week we're going to do... Uh, uh, we're going to bring more pointers together. Okay, this is just an introduction. So uh, apparently I went too hard on the arrays introduction, so I'm slowing down the pointers introduction to be a little bit slower to give you a little bit of a chance for it to sink in and very simple pieces of code that you can then go and play around with, you know, put stars and ampersands everywhere to see what it actually does, okay? All right, let's have a look. Uh, oh, someone's asked, can you use pointers on structs? Of course you can. You can do all sorts of amazing things. You can you can have struct pointers as well. Absolutely. Um, okay, let's do one more thing. I'd like to demonstrate what arrays are, if they are a pointer or if they're not. And they're not a pointer, but they do have something a little bit in common sometimes, okay? So look at me, back to arrays. I love arrays. It's a bit of a love story. Can we please open a new file um, and start doing it again? Absolutely, we can. Uh, so we'll open up getitlovestory.c. That's all right. 
Um, uh -huh. So we just say yes. All right, include stdio.h in main void. And we'll add in a return zero. What would you like to do, Sasha? Okay, so what I would like to do is I'd like to declare and initialize an array, please. All righty, so let's oop, do... Please declare and initialize an array for me. An array, all right. So what type would you like the array to be? I would like it to be of type int. Alrighty, what should we call it? Uh, let's call it array. Absolutely, and how big would you like it to be? Let's go very small so that we can see what's going on. So let's have the array be uh, three, size three. Size three, alrighty. So I've made an array of size three. What should we do now? And let's do uh, e, uh, square bracket, uh, you've got it already, and yep. initialize it all to zero. So in curly brackets, have a zero. Absolutely, so we're initializing it all equals curly brackets zero close curly brackets done amazing okay now i'm going to loop through this array and what i want to do is i want to print out the addresses of each of the elements in that array okay so Ooh. can you please create the structure of the loop for me so int i is equal to zero absolutely we'll do that first what's up next um and then while i is less than three for my condition of the loop Alrighty. while i is less than three what should we do at the end of the loop and then in the end of the loop if you could please increment the loop for me or update that uh, loop variable that i'm using which i'm going to use in an increment fashion because i'm going from zero to three Alrighty. so we've got an i plus plus at the bottom there what do we want to do in the body of the loop and in the body of the loop could i please have you print f for me the address of the array and in square brackets percent d no, uh, is the, percent d new line of the array at index percent d is percent p already new line and yeah. what are those percent d and percent p going to be okay so the percent the first percent d is the index of my array so it's my i yeah i okay and the second one I want to percent P, which as we've learned uh, in the last sort of half an hour means memory address off. So if I need a memory address off, uh, I'm going to be printing out, then I want an ampersand. Alrighty, ampersand. And I want it off the array at index I. Array at index I. I, I, that's done. Thank you so much. And then after this while loop, just to freak you all out, before Alrighty. the return zero. Yep. Could you please print F? Yep. The address of the array is percent P. Alrighty. And what percent P do we want to print out? And I would like to print out percent P just array. Just array. Oh, all right. So just array, no. close brackets, Ricky. semicolon. So note, I haven't put an ampersand down, but I've, what I've got in there as my name, as the variable name, is the variable name of the array. Just the array, no index, no nothing, just the array. Could you please run this piece of code for me? Absolutely, I can. So we're going to go, uh, we've saved it. We'll run, go back into the terminal. We'll dcc o love story love, love story dot c. We'll dot slash love story. And. We've got a very interesting output here, Sasha. So we've got, we've, we've printed out the address of the array at index zero is some numbers, at one, some more numbers, and at two is even more numbers. And then the address of the array at the bottom is another number. But there's something okay. interesting about those numbers, isn't there? And what is so interesting, does that number, the very first one, does it match the percent P of the array? Why, yes, it does, Sasha. Amazing. So if you notice that address of the array at index zero is exactly the same as the address of the array itself. Okay. So notice that those two are the same. So an array name is like a constant pointer to the array, which is why when you send an array to a function, you just give an array name. Okay. Because you are actually giving the address of that array of the first element in the array. So that's why we can input a whole array into a function just by giving the array name as input. Okay. So arrays are not pointers. They're not the same thing, but 
um, they do have this, uh, they're two different things, but an array name is a constant pointer to their array. So you kind of have, um, you know, you can give a function an array because it will know what address to go to. Um, so that means that arrays are even more amazing than you first thought. Um, they're even cooler than before. Um, so that's, that's all very exciting. I hope you're just as excited by this as I am. And that's the relevance between arrays and pointers. So that's quite nice. And this is really probably going to be the end of our introduction to pointers because I would like to do something more complex, which will take a little bit longer. So we're going to do that um, next week. So now we've got a few minutes. So please uh, pop your questions in the chat. Give us your questions. Also, uh, let's, uh, if you guys can, let me, uh, Tom, could you please share my screen? If you could please let us know if uh, this was an okay lecture format, us doing it like this, or if you'd rather go back um, to me doing all the typing and talking, or if this was uh, a better, better way to do it. Um, so please let us know what you think, which way you like better. Okay. Got a few questions. If you, if when you give a function an array, is it modifying the original array since it has the address? An excellent question, isn't it? Yes, well done. Exactly correct. That is why arrays are awesome. Um, okay, so a few people. Uh, well, if you, one person has said they like this lecture format, but I've made it a few people, why not? Um, in the intro pointer function, are we sending the value of num back to the number pointer, which sends it into the value number? Um, I actually, I'm not sure what uh, is being asked. Sorry, there's too many, too many elements to that question. In the intro pointer, let's, uh, Tom, if, can you please, um, I can't see what the code is, Tom. Yep, absolutely. Do you want me to jump back to the code? Yes, please. I've jumped back to the code. There we go, it's visible. It'll be visible to you in a moment. Um, alrighty, code is now visible. So in memory, when you have an, an array, okay, an array is, uh, it's stored in consecutive chunks of memory, okay? What that means is if you have the address to the first bit of memory, which you, which is the very first address of your first index, that means you can figure out everything else because you know the size of that array. So let's say it's an array of int, then it will increase every four bytes because that's um, the size of one int, okay? So what it means is, that uh, knowing the first address kind of lets you know all the rest of them very easily as well, which means that you can access things very easily through using the indexes. So oh, Tom can point it out on the code. As you can see, we had an array of type int and you can see that the increases in the addresses are by four bytes each time. Yep, so I've pointed that out. Or well, someone did ask me if you can do pointer maths. You can, but it's don't do it. It's uh, it's very dangerous to do pointer maths because you're playing around with memory addresses. So you are highly likely um, to cause chaos. You're playing with forces you don't understand. Yeah, you will burn. Um, so Jordan said he's confused how we made the number increment without returning in the function. So we Ooh. were able to incremented because we used a pointer. We didn't use uh, a variable. So because we were incrementing at the address of that variable, we, when we use the star, what it meant is, can you go to that address and can you take out what's in that address? And then can you, can you increase it? And that's great, I did. And then what we've done is we've stored it inside 
that point as well. So at that address as well, we've stored it, which means that we don't have to return anything because we've just done the increment inside that memory address. All I right. hope that explained it. Okay, all right, we've hit the two o'clock mark, I guess. Uh, I hope everyone has had a good uh, Wednesday, hump day. Yay, halfway through the week. Don't forget tomorrow, 6.30, we've got an exciting, um, you know, absolutely just an event for the calendar for you guys. And since we're still in lockdown, it could well be an event for the calendar. It is our assignment overview day. So please join us at 6.30 p.m. for an assignment overview. Uh, tomorrow where you will be, uh, you know, kind of intro overview and we will set you up to start the assignment if you haven't done so already. Although I can see on the forums people have started. Uh, do not be overwhelmed. Do not feel worried if you haven't started. It is not a problem. We will get you ready to start tomorrow. So I hope you all have a good rest of the week. We will look forward to seeing you next week for more pointers, uh, some debugging and a few more things. And then tomorrow for our assignment overview. All right. Have a good week, guys. See you later. Bye.